Donc, bah, bonjour à tous. Euh, ça me fait plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour cette seconde conférence dans le cadre de la 30e journée scientifique de l'Institut de cancer de Montréal, qui sera donnée par Dr Gibbings. Un grand merci à nos partenaires Optimal et Roche, donc qui sont nos partenaires Or et nos partenaires Argent, Stardest et Miltini Biotech qui ont rendu possible la réalisation de cette journée scientifique. Mais avant de présenter Dr Gippings, je vais laisser la parole à Madame Isabelle Gagnon de chez Roche qui va nous faire une brève présentation de 5 minutes environ. Madame Gagnon, c'est à vous. Merci. Pardon, j'ai été déconnectée. Alors, bonjour chers invités. Au nom de Roche, il nous fait plaisir de supporter cet événement. Excusez, petit problème technique. Il me fait particulièrement plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui en virtuel et d'avoir pu éviter ceci. Plus sérieusement, lorsque j'ai su que j'aurais la chance de vous faire une brève allocution, j'ai voulu m'inspirer des quatre grands axes de l'Institut et vous présenter comment nous travaillons aussi basé sur ces axes. Alors que la demande de soins de santé augmente et que les systèmes de santé recherchent des moyens de gérer leurs dépenses, il est essentiel que nous contribuions à la solution. C'est pourquoi nous visons à apporter nos progrès médicaux à la moitié du coût pour la société et doubler l'accès des patients à des solutions diagnostiques à haute valeur médicale d'ici 2030. Nous investissons plus que jamais dans la recherche et le développement pour ainsi améliorer notre offre de traitement. Nous nous notre ambition, pardon, dis-je bien, est, est ben, au-delà de prévenir les maladies grâce à une intervention précoce, nous voulons garantir que les patients reçoivent le bon traitement au bon moment, éviter les thérapies inutiles et éliminer le gaspillage médical. En tant que groupe proche, nous adoptons la meilleure technologie et les meilleurs partenariats grâce à notre structure pharmaceutique ou diagnostique unique pour faire avancer la science et développer de nouvelles thérapies. Nous combinons l'expertise en biologie moléculaire et les technologies de diagnostic pour bénéficier du continuum de soins aux patients. La détection précoce à la prévention, au diagnostic, à la thérapie et finalement la surveillance. Actuellement, nous assistons à une convergence des disciplines, par exemple en cancer du poumon. Nous pouvons offrir la biopsie tissulaire ou liquide selon les besoins du patient, la détection ou le traitement par l'immunothérapie tout en utilisant la pathologie digitale et le séquençage. De nouveaux traitements peuvent maintenant cibler les altérations génomiques et non plus seulement le type de tumeur, qu'on appelle les tumeurs agnostiques. D'ailleurs, une des grandes avancées est la montée de la génomique. Nous nous efforçons à faire évoluer le diagnostic du cancer en allant au-delà du biomarqueur unique, mais en travaillant avec les différents partenaires pour séquencer le génome complet. Nous assistons actuellement à une explosion des informations sur les soins de santé fournis par les technologies modernes qui génèrent une mine de nouvelles données et de connaissances dans le domaine du cancer. Parmi les nombreux types de cancers, des centaines de gènes ont été impliqués dans leur développement et chacun d'entre eux pouvant avoir une variété de mutations conduisant à des profils uniques du cancer. Heureusement, notre connaissance de ces gènes se développe chaque jour. Une plus grande disponibilité du séquençage conduira à une plus grande collecte de données génomiques sur les individus. À cet effet, de vastes quantités de données sans précédent et provenant de sources multiples et nouvelles nous outillerons pour les futurs soins aux patients. Nous avons toujours utilisé des données pour éclairer notre travail, mais il n'y a aucune comparaison entre les données dont nous disposons maintenant et celles que nous avions dans le passé. Ces données, combinées à d'autres formes de diagnostic, contiendront des informations précieuses sur les individus et amélioreront les possibilité de personnalisation des soins contre le cancer. Finalement, pour améliorer les soins au-delà de la médecine pour chaque patient, nous devons travailler vers l'extérieur à partir du patient et de ses besoins en matière de soins de santé. Ces besoins déterminent la combinaison des données 
des technologies et des analyses qui doivent être réunies. L'approche des soins de santé personnalisés vise à améliorer les résultats pour les patients et à faire progresser la recherche clinique qui, on le constate, est vraiment primordiale. Il ne suffit plus que l'industrie pharmaceutique se concentre uniquement sur le développement de médicaments ou de diagnostics. Les perspectives et les solutions qui améliorent les résultats pour les patients dans tout le continuum de soins de santé sont également importantes. Pour résoudre les plus grands défis en santé, il faut collaboration et partenariat. Toutes les parties prenantes doivent travailler ensemble pour fournir des solutions spécifiquement conçues pour répondre aux besoins de chaque patient. Je vous remercie de votre attention et bonne conférence. Merci, Madame Gagnon. Donc, comme je vous le disais, nous avons la chance d'accueillir Dr. Gibbings aujourd'hui, qui va nous parler de la biogénèse et de l'aspect thérapeutique des vésicules extracellulaires. Donc, brièvement, Dr. Gibbings a obtenu son doctorat à l'Université d'Alberta en 2006. Il a par la suite réalisé deux postdoctorats, un au Centre national de la recherche scientifique en France et un autre à l'École polytechnique fédérale à Zurich en Suisse. Il est ensuite retourné ici au Canada en 2012 à l'Université d'Ottawa où il est devenu professeur associé depuis 2018. Dr Gibbings a supervisé près d'une trentaine d'étudiants et compte 22, 22 publications à son actif. Son laboratoire se concentre sur deux sujets principaux, l'autophagie et les vésicules extracellulaires. Il a été parmi les premiers à découvrir un mécanisme transportant les complexes d'ARN et les micro-ARN dans ces vésicules. Je vais maintenant laisser la parole à Dr Gibbings et pour euh, information, vous pouvez vous poser vos questions directement dans la section questions et réponses durant la présentation. Dr Gibbings, merci d'avoir accepté notre invitation et une bonne conférence à tous. Merci Maxime. Je suis très heureux d'être invité et d'avoir la chance de partager avec vous quelques de l'œuvre que nous avons fait sur les extracellulaires vesicules. Je vais faire la présentation en anglais, mais uh, je, je suis uh, heureux de, de répondre aux questions en français aussi. Um, so I will I'll just share my screen with you. So what I'd like to do today is to um, talk to you about um, what we've learned um, over the last decade, really, working on extracellular vesicles and where that's taken us in, in terms of trying to develop them as potential therapeutics. And along the way, I hope to, show you, to share with you some of what I see as some of the um, challenges um, in doing research on extracellular vesicles, developing them for diagnostics and therapeutics, and then some of the kind of forward-looking questions that I think are really outstanding in the field of extracellular vesicles. So just to keep on time, I might need to skip some slides now and then, so I apologize for that. So to begin with, um, you know, extracellular vesicles, most of you have probably seen this kind of slide before, but I'm going to focus on small extracellular vesicles today. And there's probably two sources for those things. Most of the literature suggests, based on a hypothetical model mostly, that most of these vesicles are produced in late endosomes or multivesicular endosomes by budding into these endosomes to form vesicles. And then when these endosomes fuse with the plasma membrane, these intraluminal vesicles are released into the cytoplasm where they're known as small extracellular vesicles, SEVs, or exosomes. But there is a bunch of literature as well that similar vesicles of similar size can also bud from the plasma membrane. And those kind of divergences are probably contributing to some of the heterogeneity that we see in literature when we talk about extracellular vesicles. So what are these things? Really, they're almost structured like miniature cells when you think about it. They're about 30 to 150 nanometers in size. Like a cell, they have a lipid bilayer that's populated with transmembrane proteins. In the interior, they have uh, soluble proteins derived from the cytoplasm of cells. They have RNAs and they carry metabolites as well. And one of the things that we've really focused on uh, 
in our research because we think that it's going to inform all of our thinking about what extracellular vesicles do uh, in, in biology and in disease and also inform diagnostics is to focus on how these things, how the vesicles are made and what's packaging them with specific proteins or RNAs. So I told you that they're formed by this process of budding into uh, late endosomes. So that process in more detail is depicted here. You can see that we know a fair bit about, for example, escort complexes that can for cause this inward budding of endosomal membranes to form kind of ceramide rich uh, vesicles in the endosome that are then going to become uh, exosomes. But I think we have uh, a lot more to learn about processes that are making these as well as um, how they're packaged with specific contents from the cytoplasm. And that's depicted in this slide. Um, so if we, if we purify or others purify um, extracellular vesicles from cells and then profile the contents compared to the cells that produced those extracellular vesicles, we see that the extracellular vesicles are highly enriched in a very small subset of, of molecules from the cell. And they contain actually a very small, almost disappearing amount of you know, the vast majority of, of uh, molecules in a cell. So that's depicted here for RNAs, where you can see there's lots of very abundant cellular RNAs that don't make it into exosomes. And there's very few RNAs that are actually highly enriched in exosomes. Uh, work from others has shown similar patterns uh, for proteins and lipids, where you can see there's very small populations of proteins that are enriched in, in uh, extracellular vesicles, and the vast majority are not enriched at all or kind of excluded from them. And so some of the early work that we did um, uh, way back around 2009 uh, showed that these extracellular vesicles, in fact, did contain uh, RNAs, like microRNAs. And we found that, in fact, if we, uh, that microRNAs were controlling the packaging of messenger RNAs into, um, into the extracellular vesicles. So if we um, had an RNA that we targeted artificially uh, with, with uh, microRNA that wasn't causing the degradation of its RNA in the cell, then that RNA would be excluded from uh, the exosomes or small extracellular vesicles. And we saw that that kind of pattern was reproduced at the whole, uh, at the whole genome level as well. And so uh, based on that information, we came up with this idea that you could potentially use that information uh, for diagnostics. And so we ended up partnering with uh, Alnylam Pharmaceuticals, a company that develops sRNA therapies. Um, and uh, with them, we uh, developed this method that they call the circulating extracellular uh, diagnostic. And what they, what they showed, which I think is very powerful, is that if they deliver an sRNA into an animal, they can knock down that target in the liver over a time course. And when they sample the messenger RNAs in the extracellular vesicles over the same time course, it parallels very closely what's happening in the liver. And so I think that makes a really nice proof of concept uh, that you can do diagnostics with extracellular vesicles and they can reflect very closely what is happening in tissues. But I think this works because this is in a very abundant uh, messenger RNA and it's not going to work for every cell type. Not all of them will put a lot of extracellular vesicles into the, into the blood, for example, and not enough of the all molecules will be abundant enough to be detected. Um, and so they're using this uh, as readouts in their clinical trials for different therapies that have now gone to market to make sure that patients are getting doses and the drug is effective. So since starting my own lab, um, we've taken a turn more to looking, looking and thinking about extracellular vesicles as potentially therapeutic delivery vehicles. And so, um, you know, what I'd like to focus on today is a bit of this idea of whether extracellular vesicles are really great delivery vehicles, a natural communication system, and what is the real evidence behind that? Because historically, 
for over a decade, the model um, in the exosome field was that extracellular vesicles were basically helping to eliminate uh, proteins from cells, and then those exosomes would be cleared by phagocytes and degraded. And so one of the dominant models was based on the elimination of transferrin receptor from maturing red blood cells that no longer needed it. And then, you know, about 2007, this model started to take hold that exosomes could uh, deliver RNA proteins and other molecules between cells. And I think, you know, that's taken hold in the literature a bit and become almost uh, hyperbolic in some sense. And sometimes we're starting to think that EVs from any cell type are going to deliver their cargoes to any other cell type. And you know, any molecule that we can detect in EVs is going to have an effect in its target cells. And I think that's leading sometimes down paths that are unfruitful in terms of research. And one of the main things I think that challenges that kind of hypothesis of mass delivery of cargoes by extracellular vesicles is simply the fact of the importance of cellular differentiation and identity. Right. I mean, with technologies like single cell sequencing or even basic histology, I mean, we know that cell differentiation is fundamental to complex organisms. And so that's kind of in direct contradiction with this idea that EVs are going to be released by all cell types and contribute really important cell differentiation, activation, identification properties to other cell types. Because if that was really true, we would kind of lose this cell differentiation, uh, which is critical to all organisms. So I think we have to find that kind of middle ground of what, what is the actual biological function. And the other thing that I think is really important to think about uh, in, when we think about EVs is the topology of these membranes, right? So when they're made, the material that's packaged into them is coming from the cytoplasm and potentially the nucleus eventually. When those exosomes or extracellular vesicles then fuse with target cells, it's the contents that are inside of those EVs that are going to end up in the uh, cytoplasm of the target cell. But if something's on the surface of an EV, it's going to stay basically trapped in the endosome or lysosome. And so it's not just because something we attach something to the outside of an EV, for example, that it's going to work in the cytoplasm of a cell. And I mean, the other part of this is just this idea that if an EV goes somewhere and a cell takes it up, that therefore it means that it's active and it's delivered all its cargoes to uh, the cell. And you know, so if we again think of this from basic kind of biology of what we know, Cells are really good at internalizing basically anything that they encounter from bacterial and viral pathogens to you know, gold iron nanoparticles, protein aggregates, lipid complexes. And almost all of those things are really shuttle, the cell is internalizing them to shuttle them into the lysosome uh, for degradation. And so I think there, a, lot of the, a lot of what we see with EVs might in fact, it, when they're internalized, might be leading to degradation and not usually these fusion ideas and communication that we're, that we're often focused on. So, but I think one of the kind of outstanding uh, questions in the field is really this idea of how would this work for extracellular vesicles to fuse with their target cells? So membrane fusion is not something new. You know, we have lots of examples of it in intracellular vesicles with snares as a well-defined system controlling uh, in, uh, vesicle fusion. And between cells, we also have examples from myoblasts that fuse, uh, from trophoblasts that fuse to make uh, syncytia, egg and sperm. And so I think one of the outstanding questions for us to answer is really, is there something like a snare-like fusion system that's actually governing the fusion of extracellular vesicles with cells? And if we could understand and harness that kind of a fusion system, then we could turn it potentially into a really uh, important drug discovery to our drug delivery um, tool. So the last part of the background that I think is, is important to set up what I wanna talk to you about today is this challenge of drug delivery uh, for therapeutics. 
And so, you know, molecules that are kind of 500 Daltons or less are, you know, usually pass reasonably through the plasma membrane, distribute well through organisms and work well. And so drug development is really, for that reason, focused on small molecules as the best and easiest type of drugs to have work in people. You know, in the last two decades, we've had these drugs like silencing RNAs, CRISPR, or messenger RNAs that have been developed that have enormous potential to very kind of specifically uh, for long durations, you know, affect gene expression. So with silencing RNAs, we, all, we have drugs from Allen Island on the market now targeting things in the liver, and they're capable of reducing expression of a messenger RNA in a patient for by over 80% for six months. So if you can basically design silencing RNA or CRISPR to target whatever you want and have these kinds of long lasting um, effects in patients, that would be incredible. But the problem with these is all that, of course, that they're too big to get into cells and distribute like these small molecules. And so, you know, the traditional approaches for these things to date has been to use things like lipid nanoparticles uh, to package them inside of these lipids for delivery or for the liver to use this Galnac uh, ligand, which binds to this highly abundant receptor on hepatocytes. And because this receptor is so abundant and so fast recycling, it lets the cells internalize enough that enough gets out into, this, into the cytoplasm that these drugs can actually work. So these, these two delivery vehicles are basically in approved drugs and in, in tons of drug development programs, and they work pretty well, really. Uh, they've evolved a lot, um, but they really only work in a couple organs, uh, and that's because they escape into the into the organ because of how the uh, endothelium is set up, and in places with fenestrated or sinusoidal uh, endothelium like liver, kidney, and small intestine, you get enough of these things accumulating that they could work. And so what we see. In, uh, in the clinic is that most of these kind of advanced therapeutic classes are really limited to going after proteins expressed in the liver. And that's because that's where these things accumulate the most. Uh, and if you try to push up the doses higher to get enough accumulating in kidney or small intestine or somewhere else, usually there's a dose limiting toxicity in patients. And in fact, even that toxicity has shut down clinical trials with lipid nanoparticles and Galnac from a number of companies. And so it's already at kind of that threshold of toxicity. And so when these things actually contact cells, what happens is they, like all these other things, get internalized into endosomes and lysosomes. They accumulate in these early and late endosomes and actually will hang around there for months in patients. And every once in a while, uh, as shown in this paper in Nature Biotechnology in 2015. They're looking at the siRNA in the cell, and every once in a while, it'll pierce the endosome just enough that some escapes and then kind of diffuses throughout the cell. But you can see there's still a whole lot left in that endosome, uh, even after this. And so, you know, what we've learned from quantitative studies from a number of groups is that even if we've, you know, Lots of people have spent years of their lives optimizing these things over decades, and they still only really deliver about one in every thousand molecules that they carry into or put into cells or into an organism. And so they're still pretty inefficient, but good enough to work. So the question really is, is our extracellular vesicles better at delivery than these inefficient current delivery vehicles? And there was an enormous amount of uh, excitement about uh, EVs doing this in the early days. And this led to big influxes of money into companies like Kodiak and Evox that have been playing around to try to make this work for about the last four or five years. And I think what's really happened is that um, those efforts haven't gone nearly as quickly as one would expect in the biotech industry with $200 million. And we've seen some of these companies basically retreat from a focus on things like RNA delivery. So that tells you that it's probably not as easy as we thought it was. And that that excitement is maybe going through this kind of reality check phase. And so I want to talk to you a bit about that. So 
if we look back actually the literature uh, that these companies were founded on, um, a lot of it was founded on this electroporation idea. So you take exosomes and you electroporate them with RNA. And then they showed that you could get knocked down of things uh, after these, you administer these electroporated uh, exosomes in animals. But when we crunch the numbers and we look at kind of the efficiency of delivery um, based on you know, how many sRNAs does it talk, take to knock down a target and how many do they have to administer to cells or an animal to do that, what we can see pretty quickly actually is that with those approaches of uh, using exosomes, it requires at least as much RNA as an LNP and usually about 100 or 1,000 or even more times as much sRNA as a lipid nanoparticle to knock down a target. And so that's basically telling us that most of this data suggests that, in fact, extracellular vesicles are a much worse uh, delivery vehicle than these inefficient delivery vehicles that we already have. And so some of that um, is, is, was, um, so this is basically a figure from a foundational paper in Nature Biotechnology from the founders of Evox in 2011. And you can basically see here that electroporated exosomes and just uh, sRNA alone with the same targeting peptide basically do the same thing, kind of telling us already that the exosomes aren't really helping much here. And the reason for that is that it seems that this, tech, this approach in most people's hands anyways, actually creates an artifact. And that is that if you just electroporate the sRNA, that it precipitates and it can be pelleted by ultracentrifugation, just like an exosome, it becomes resistant to the RNA's treatment. Um, and so you can basically be mistaking an effect of the exosomes for just a simply an effect of precipitated sRNA that then is kind of purified and delivered with the exosomes. So a, a nice, uh, some nice work in uh, 2013 showed this and we reproduced it, where basically um, electroporation breaks exosomes up as uh, we know from cells. Um, if you just precipitate or electroporate sRNA, it's ultra centrifuged and is RNA resistant, just like if you have exosomes there and that that um, RNA is actually resistant to um, RNA's treatment as well. So it's a technique to approach, I think, with great caution and careful checking of, of all of your findings because it is prone to artifacts. Another risky approach to this um, that we're learning about is uh, this idea that you can transfect cells with something like an, uh, an to express something like an RNA and then purify the exosomes from those cells and look at their function. So we know that lipid nanoparticles and other transfection complexes accumulate in endosomes and lysosomes. And when they're there, that's basically where the uh, exosomes are made, right? So they're interacting in these endosomes with um, the exosomes. And so that could lead to a number of different things that could happen. One is that the transfection complexes are basically spat out of the cells uh, alongside of the exosomes. And then when you purify exosomes, you're actually also purifying transfection complexes. And the other is that the transfection complexes could fuse with the exosomes or alter the exosomes in the endosome. And then you don't really, you're not really studying exosomes anymore, but studying some kind of hybrid um, that doesn't reflect the real biology. And so we tested out those models. Uh, and what we basically found uh, is that if you take a standard lipid nanoparticle-like transfection complex, like RNAIMAX, uh, and you basically ask, does it look like an exosome by our usual methods? Uh, you can ultra-centrifuge it and uh, purify um, the RNA in a similar way as you would expect with exosomes. The RNA is partially uh, RNAs resistant in it as exosomes. If you do a size profile of transfection complexes, it looks like exosomes. And so this all again points to uh, the fact, and we've done lipid profiles actually of these things as well, 
to show that you kind of get contamination of transfection complex lipids in, in EV preps after transfecting cells. And so this again suggests that this is not really a great way to study the biological functions of EVs because there's a good risk that we're actually mistaking functions of transfection complexes for the function of EVs. So what does this all mean? I mean, I think what we've learned by doing, by getting dragged into a bunch of those kinds of studies that I just talked to you about is that if we want to package things into EVs for delivery as therapeutics, that they probably have to be packaged inside of the EVs if we want them to be delivered into the cytoplasm after fusion with cells. Um, they probably have to be directly expressed by the cells and not transfected. And they should be highly enriched in EVs. They can't be one of these, you know, highly, you can't ex just express a lot of a protein or RNA and hope that it's going to get into exosomes because it just won't work very well. So as a solution to this, I mean, some of the, I think the Kodiaks and the Evoxes from patent data and other things like that are, are going in a direction of basically trying to engineer RNA packaging into exosomes by say, for example, looking at RNA binding proteins that bind to known RNAs and engineering them to, to um, fuse them to things that are enriched in exosomes and then try to get the RNAs forced into the extracellular vesicles for delivery. That's a challenging uh, one potentially as well because there's a lot of things happening and it's hard to always engineer a sequence motif into something like a small RNA and still have a good sRNA. And, and in fact, when we've looked at reports of, you know, RNA binding proteins that are known to package, have been published to package RNAs into exosomes. And we just asked this question, are they enriched in the exosomes or not? Most of them aren't really. These are kind of standard way to check if something is enriched in exosomes. You load a similar amount of lysate from the cells in exosomes. Things that are abundant in the exosomes should be at least at the same level as in the cell or more abundant. And these things aren't. And so, I'm not sure we have a clear way to do this kind of thing quite yet. So what we found is um, that if we, we found this uh, MIR451 that is highly enriched in exosomes over many cell types. Um, and so it's enriched about a thousand to 10,000 fold in the EVs uh, from a bunch of different cell types we've tested compared to most other uh, microRNAs. And they're really EVs, if we purify them on sucrose gradients and do the same thing, we see that this uh, microRNA is really in those EVs. I'm gonna skip over a few things just to kind of keep on time a bit more, but a lot of people had seen that this microRNA was really enriched in EVs. It was often at the top of people's lists for enrichment, but they really ignored it because they thought it was coming from contamination with FBS because there's a lot of this microRNA in blood cells and in blood exosomes. And so we did a bunch of work to basically show that it wasn't possible that this MIR451 was coming from any kind of FBS contamination by doing long-term cultures and serum-free media and kind of dilution type studies. And what's really interesting about this pre-microRNA is that it, sh it follows a unique biogenesis pathway compared to all other uh, pre-microRNAs. So most pre-microRNAs are about 60 to 120 nucleotides long, like this MIR-144. And then after Drosha processes them, Dicer enzyme is going to basically grab onto these and cleave off the kind of pre or the microRNAs, microRNA star strand from them. This MIR-451 is shorter though, it's only 42 nucleotides long after being cleaved by Drosha. And so it's too short to be processed by uh, Dicer. And so a number of groups in 2010 showed that it followed this unique biogenesis pathway, whereby it, uh, it binds to the sRNA uh, kind of enzymatic cleavage effector protein Argonaut 2, and that cleaves one of the strands and then it gets chewed back and you basically end up with a mature microRNA loaded into the effector protein already Argonaut 2. And importantly, what these groups had shown in 2010, um, maybe I've got it here better displayed, is that 
you could take any sequence that you wanted and basically reprogram this premier 451 structure with it, and it would be processed in the same way into a mature um, siRNA. And so, you know, if this is the processing of MIR-451, if we want an siRNA, say, against SOD1, we insert that sequence here, and we just change all of the rest of this sequence to be complementary to that SOD1 siRNA. And so what we showed is that if we reprogram this premier 451 sequence with siRNAs against a bunch of different targets, uh, that they were similarly enriched in the exosomes uh, produced by those cells. So in the, in the range of 100 to 10,000 fold. Um, and so that tells us that it's probably this hairpin structure that's important for the packaging into exosomes and not the specific sequence that's actually in that structure. And so I'll maybe uh, skip over some of this, but basically we did a bunch of work to show that uh, it's really the hairpin that's going into the exosomes um, and that it was not dependent, or if we knocked out Argonaut 2 and the cells making the exosomes so they couldn't even uh, cleave it into its mature form, that it was still packaged into exosomes. And so it really uh, showed that the hairpin is what's being packaged into the exosomes and reinforces this idea that we can basically reprogram the structure and package siRNAs of our choosing into exosomes. And so what we have done a lot of and, um, and have learned a lot from doing is kind of an absolute quantification of things like microRNAs and exosomes. And so for this, what we've done is you know, we can use nanoparticle tracking to basically count um, exosomes and we can standardize it against kind of similarly sized polystyrene beads. Um, and then we can count the RNA copies in exosomes using standard curve uh, RTQPCR, so kind of known concentrations to create a standard curve. Um, and that allows us to kind of to calculate out how many microRNAs are in um, exosomes. And so papers had shown this before that in fact, if you look for any specific microRNA in an exosome, uh, the maximum you'll find is about one copy uh, per exosome. And so they're really not very abundant in exosomes overall. Um, but what, what we could find is that with this system, we were basically getting to that kind of level of about one copy uh, of siRNAs per exosome. And so it seems to kind of capture endogenous packaging mechanisms, hijacking kind of the, the na natural packaging biology of extracellular vesicles to put siRNAs of our choosing into them. Then when we put some of these EVs on target cells, we can see the sRNA goes to P bodies where RNA silencing uh, can occur, suggesting that it's kind of really getting to it, delivering and getting to its target. It doesn't work anymore if we knock out Argonaut 2, so it's really kind of sRNA specific. Um, and so then we started to take these um, EVs into mice. And what we found is we could label them with a couple of different strategies, either with fluorescent lipids or putting small fluorophores on to proteins on their surface. And the distribution in animals um, really follows most things that you put into animals of a similar size. There's a lot in liver, spleen, lungs, kidney, and then kind of decreasing distribution in a lot of other tissues. And they distribute fairly well through tissues like the brain when they're injected directly there. But one of the major things we've learned doing you know, a lot of work on this over the last five years is that there's a lot of these tissues where there's a lot of exosomes accumulating, but we can find no sign of siRNA delivery right out as kind of knockdown of a target in those tissues. And so that really emphasizes for us this message that. Um, exosome accumulation somewhere doesn't equal to delivery of cytoplasmic contents. And so we've never seen any sign of a knockdown in heart, lungs, brown fat, spleen, at the whole tissue level. So in trying to think of this as a therapeutic, we wanted to compare how 
efficient these were at delivery compared to kind of a best in class lipid nanoparticle. So we partnered with Daniel Anderson at MIT who's developed the lipid nanoparticles for alnylam that are now approved um, and, and in use in the clinic. And we used a target that is the, the target of that siRNA therapy called TTR. And it's nice because it's a liver express protein, but it's released into the blood. And so you can do blood readouts and monitor the efficacy of the therapy. And what we learned from those studies is that uh, with a single dose of a lipid nanoparticle or, or an exosome packaged with sRNA using our system, that the exosomes could knock down to a similar level, a target like TTR in the liver, but using about 30 fold uh, less sRNA than the lipid nanoparticles. And so that suggests to us that the exosomes are much more efficient at delivering than lipid nanoparticles are. And so there might be something to this idea that they are really good delivery vehicles. Um, so in that process, I mean, we've thought a lot about how many exosomes does it really take and how many sRNAs, for example, does it really take to do something? And the only thing that I wanna highlight on this slide here is the importance of this idea of quantifying everything you think of doing with extracellular vesicles. Because running through that math of like, how many copies of sRNA do I have? How many are needed in a cell to actually knock something down or to affect my phenotype? How many cells would it have to get into in the body of a mouse or a human to actually do that? When you run that math, I think I've been on lots of committees and probably seen some grants and different things where the math just doesn't line up. Where, you know, if at the end of the day you have you know, 100,000 exosomes and you're trying to treat an animal where there's, you know, 150 million hepatocytes, the chances that you're going to ever do anything because you can't even get one exosome to every hepatocyte, it's not going to work, right? And so I think this is one of the major pitfalls of what, where we run into problems in, in EV research. And I think what, that me, what, what we've learned from thinking through some of those things for our work on RNAs is that um, it's really only going to be the things that are highly enriched in exosomes and where the exosomes are targeting fairly specifically to a cell type where you're actually going to have biologically relevant effects in an animal. But the other part of that that we've seen is that in fact the extracellular vesicles only deliver about 10% of their cargoes into the cytoplasm. So you know that's better than a lipid nanoparticle but it's also not perfect. And in some ways, you kind of wonder if this was a really evolutionarily important, biologically important function of vesicles, wouldn't they be better at it? Or, you know, is it always all types of maybe heterogeneous populations of exosomes? Maybe only some of them are actually capable of delivery. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, the things that are really going to be functional in exosomes are probably those things that are highly enriched have more enzymatic activity and aren't just like building blocks. Like I don't think you'll ever deliver enough actin to a cell to actually affect it in any way, shape or form. Because anyone who's worked I think on EVs knows that you get this tiny little pellet from a big wad of cells. And so the, the math just doesn't work out. So we've used this um, technique of fish to quantify RNA and to zoom in into tissues to see if there's also cell-specific delivery of sRNAs. And using that method in liver, we see better delivery to hepatocytes than to things like Kupfer cells in brains to neurons rather than microglia. Um, and in kidney, we see nice delivery to the glomeruli. Um, so, you know, we've been trying to build this out as potentially a therapeutic platform for sRNA delivery. And so we've tried to build in these ideas that um, not all vesicles from not every or any cell type will deliver to any tissue or any cell that we want to focus on. Um, not all sRNA will be packaged into the vesicles equally because some might be held back by RNA binding proteins binding to their specific sequences in the cytoplasm. And we really wanted to focus on things 
that were well-validated targets in disease. So things like gain-of-function mutations um, that were well-validated in animal models to kind of get rid of this kind of hesitation from, say, investors or pharma companies. And so we have a bit of a process uh, pipeline that we do for projects in the lab where we screen siRNAs to pick one that works well. We screen to see which one of those functional siRNAs is best packaged into exosomes, reaching those kind of thresholds of a copy per EV. And then we screen a bunch of exosome types for which ones deliver well to the target or to the tissue or cell types we want to go after. And then we go into uh, testing in, in disease models. And so this kind of illustrates well one of the programs where we're looking for delivery into the brain. And if we, each of these bars is basically looking at um, exosomes packaged with the same siRNA, but from different cell sources. So each is a different cell source. And what you can see is that some of the cell sources for EVs don't deliver at all, um, whereas others work quite well and some are kind of intermediate. And that's a pattern that we've seen throughout our work on these things that there is, and it really emphasizes for us this idea that there's kind of tissue and cell specific delivery with EVs. And so we're doing that kind of process for targets in the kidney, as well as for targets in neurodegeneration. Um, I'll just briefly show you, we've got a couple targets we're working on in kidney. One is this one called TRIPC6. Uh, there's gain of function mutations in patients that cause disease and it's got this whole profile. Um, so this is basically just data showing that if we do kind of a proof of concept experiment with a GFP siRNA and we look at glomeruli in the kidney marked by nephrin, we can see that we're silencing GFP expression there, although we're not affecting too much outside of there. And so with this TRIPC6, um, there's a good case for it being important in chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. There's a nice market there for them. I won't dwell too much there. Just jump to this. So this is showing that if we put a uh, TRIPC6 siRNA into our systems and we look in a doxorubicin induced model of chronic, chronic kidney disease, we can, uh, some of the mice start to die over a few days after treatment. The TRIPC6 siRNA uh, in the exosomes can rescue that. It can also rescue things like albuminuria uh, in, the, in the urine, showing kind of glomerular dysfunction that's a key uh, sign of the disease. And decreases in serum albumin are again reversed by the TRIPC6 siRNA in the EVs, but not by a control siRNA in the EVs. And in a model of ischemia that kind of models a lot of patients get acute kidney injury after surgery, um, and TRIPC6 might be important there. Again, we can kind of uh, reverse a lot of these kind of induction of key mediators of fibrosis and inflammation associated with that, with a, a TRIPC6 siRNA embedded in our system. So we're doing similar things in neurodegenerative diseases, and we're getting increasingly excited by the fact that we think we have delivery of um, siRNAs by EVs across the blood-brain barrier. Um, as part of this, we've also been moving into larger animals. And that's because if you look at things that are about 50 nanometers in size, you see this sharp drop off in their ability to get into tissues and distribute well there. And so we've gone into rabbits um, with this TRIPC6 siRNA and sh shown that it works basically about the same as in mice. Um, and we've done, we're doing some studies in non-human primates as well. This one with TTR, the target of Ompatro, and we see a similar profile where we can silence uh, TTR um, with, with um, these exosomes. And so I will skip these because we're getting late. Um, so one of the last things that I'll just very briefly touch on is the idea of sterility. So a lot of the SEV purification protocols like ultracentrifugation are not clean and they're difficult to keep sterile even. And so that puts at risk a lot of experiments because of common contaminants like LPS that you can't get rid of with something like ethanol treatment or UV sterilization. And so there's a risk that a lot of the research that's done out there, if it's not 
clean, which is really important, as well as sterile, uh, could be due to contaminants. Um, and so when learning from that kind of experience in the lab, basically we've developed this process that we hope to be able to use for manufacturing, where we have a master cell bank stably expressing our drugs, uh, and we can do the whole process through filtration, uh, tangential flow filtration to kind of purify exosome size stuff uh, through to ready to inject into animals all in completely sterile uh, and clean conditions that are CGMP compatible. We basically learned that process from things like oncolytic viruses and AEV that are used for pharmaceutical development. And so when we make exosomes in that way, and we inject them into um, mice, put them with human PBMCs or in, in um, non-human primates, what we see is basically no change in a wide variety of cytokines and chemokines that are released. And so that, I think, reinforces the idea that they're probably not allogeneic or immunostimulatory, except maybe in some circumstances where the cells themselves are really um, inflammatory. And that kind of lines up with the idea that there's a lot of EVs in blood and we do millions of blood transfusions that are safe. And so it suggests that there's not a lot of immunogenicity there. So I'll just uh, try to bring this to a close with, you know, I think the field is really at the stage where there was a lot of initial excitement. We've reached that stage where all fields see of like, we're so excited we forget about some of the fundamentals of cell biology and math. Um, and I think we're in that of phase of recalibrating both for the drug development side as well as for the research side of um, EVs. And I think, you know, over the next few years, I am quite hopeful that we'll see that, you know, EVs come through as, uh, as a reasonable way to deliver drugs to new tissues like kidney or potentially the brain that you can't do with lipid nanoparticles and current approaches. And so what I hope I've communicated today is that extracellular vesicles can be, in fact, highly efficient delivery vehicles, but it's a very targeted system. And that makes sense from a biological perspective. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong when we're doing research on EVs. We've learned a lot ourselves by looking into some of these things. And so I point them out as kind of sharing from experience and um, things to avoid. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think what we've learned from all of this, you know, um, is that EVs, they kind of just obey the classic rules of cell biology that not everything fuses together and organism biology about how things distribute and move and, and things like that. Um, but I think some of the really big things that are left out there um, is really what are the in vivo functions of EVs? You know, a lot of EV research is in artificial cell culture systems with potentially enormous amounts of EVs per cells that will never happen in, in an organism. Um, and it's really hard to look at the in vivo function of EVs because we lack a really great way to block them specifically without blocking lots of other processes or to track them in vivo, for example, um, ones that are produced in vivo. And what are the important cargos of EVs? We've spent a lot of time and effort on microRNAs, but in fact, they're not all that abundant. So I would expect that there's a lot of even more important uh, cargos for EVs left to be discovered. What are these kind of fusion systems that are governing EV delivery? They might be really important, not only from a biological perspective of understanding, but as well, if you could put some of those fusion systems onto an engineered lipid nanoparticle, you might actually make it work as well or even better than an EV and um, make it much easier to use. And I think in my mind, at least really, this question of whether EVs are really communication vehicles or degradation, vehicles is still kind of unanswered because, you know, one, ten, one in 10 delivery is not great. Evolution usually does a better job than that. And so either it might be an accident that isn't important enough to matter to the organism, or maybe it's that there's subpopulations of exosomes that are actually the important ones for delivery. And that's where we need to focus our attention. <laughs>
So uh, in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the members of the lab. Uh, this group of people was really instrumental in most of what I told you about EVs today. We've had uh, great collaborations and discussions over many years with Wheaton Little from Decada, collaborators at MIT, uh, at Queens for the non-human primate studies, uh, and with others and been lucky enough to get funding from another uh, number of good organizations. So thank you for your attention. Sorry for taking a bit too much time. Thank you, Derek. So we have a couple of questions. One from Gerardo Ferber. Great talk and reality check for the many claims one will these days in the field. Do you expect and or know any RNA binding proteins that bind the herpin from MIR451? That's a great question. We're trying to look into that in the lab right now. Um, we have a bunch of candidates. We're screening through them, but so far there's no great hits. We know it's not Argonaut 2, though. We've done those experiments because that would be kind of the obvious one. Okay. Uh, we have um, another one, Greg Moore. When attempting to quantify measure microRNA expression within EVs, either by relative quantification using TACMAN or absolute quantification with CyberGreen, and comparing expression levels between biological fluids and patients, what approach would you recommend? Is there a housekeeping micro, a housekeeping micro RNA within the EVs, the MIR451, or would you recommend spiking with the C elegance MIR39? Yeah, those are, we could talk about those for a long, long time. Um, you know, we've used both CyberGreen, TACMAN, and Digital Droplet uh, QPCR, as well as Northern Blots. I'm not sure that there's one that's better than the others. Uh, I think in terms of diagnostics and stuff, we might see ways that are better than those standard methods emerge as more sensitive and specific even. Um, I mean, what we have learned that I, that I could share is that, you know, even things like uh, RNA purification from very small amounts, like, like we see with exosome pellets, you actually only recover about 10% or less of your RNA. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of pieces of that absolute quantification that require a lot of careful attention to get right. Um, yeah. And, and in terms of normalization for controls, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer and I don't think the field has a clear answer. I wouldn't use MIR451 because while it's highly enriched, it's not all that abundant. I mean, ourselves, we often use MIR16 or LAT7 because they're so massively abundant in cells, even if they're kind of randomly taken up in exosomes, they end up being fairly abundant already. Okay. We have a question from Mustafa Nou. A great talk and very promising research point. A methodology have a wide effect on research outcome, in your opinion. What do what extent it affect on exosome and how can we stand, standardize that? And the second question from the Mustafa, in your opinion, what are the main factors affect specific RNA or mere RNA to sort into exosome naturally? Um, so, you know, I think we, we don't know basically about what are the factors that are really important for packaging things into exosomes, but, um, you know, there are about a, le a thousand or, or more um, kind of structural, or, you know, our new RNA binding proteins, basically proteins that have other functions that we thought were their main functions, but can also bind to RNA. Things like enolase, um, that's a, a, you know, a standard kind of metabolic enzyme can also bind to RNA. And so maybe, you know, we're, we haven't found the answers by focusing on the easy ones that are kind of a handful of known RNA binding proteins. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do there to really understand what's, what's important for packaging RNAs into exosomes. Um, but since there are so few that are highly enriched in exosomes, I think it's a good way to kind of get at that question. Um, the other question was about kind of mechanisms for purification and controls and um, in your opinion, what are the main factor effects specific RNA or mRNA to sort into exosome naturally? Yeah, I think we talked about that one. 
Ah, oh, sorry. Il uh, y a une méthodologie à the wide effect on the number, in my opinion. What extent it effect on exosome and how can we standardize it? Yeah, so, I mean, methodology ends up being pretty important. So, you know, like most people are using ultracentrifugation. We know from our work and that of others that you probably lose about 50 to 75% of the EVs when you do an ultracentrifugation. And then it's also prone to these contaminants like LPS and other things. And so I think it's great for studying kind of mechanisms, but not for putting them in, back into cell systems. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a struggle to have a perfect system because at the same time, there's lots of contaminants there from other lipid, pro, uh, lipid particles to protein aggregates that in any good journal, you're going to get asked to exclude as being what affects your phenotype. And so, you know, you always end up in a bind. I mean, we're using all the time this TFF method. Um, and I think we can get away with it because we're looking at more therapeutic type development. But when we come back to trying to define a biological process, we still go to sucrose density gradient um, to show that they have the right density and they're not some of the other contaminants and stuff. Um, So I don't think that there's a great methodology that solves all our problems out there. I think we just have to be really careful about what we're doing and how we're interpreting what we see. You know, and some of the, like a good control for the LPS problem is to do basically a mock prep with just media that hasn't seen cells or something like that, right? So there are ways to control for these things. It's just, they're not regularly done, I think. Uh, we have another question from Lodin Communal. Do we know if cancer cells generally produce more EVs than normal cells? And if yes, are they more prone to be integrated by targeted cells? Mm. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of literature that they do produce more EVs. Um, but I think it's in the, you know, it's, it's probably not hundredfold and probably not even tenfold more. It's probably more like two or threefold. Um, and, you know, certainly, I mean, we've made exosomes from uh, probably 20 or 30 different types of EVs or cell, cells. And we definitely see ranges of like fivefold or maybe up to tenfold in production levels. Um, so there are things that are operating there. But uh, what was the second part of the question? They uh, if they are more prone to be integrated by targeted cells. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that I wouldn't know about. Um, you know, I guess in, in what we've done, we've used some primary cells um, and we've used some transformed and some immortalized cells. And we've seen that, you know, in say like a tissue like the liver, we have examples of each that work indistinguishably to knock down a target. So I don't think it's kind of a yes or no answer, but um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have uh, one left question. Uh, do you think uh, that autophagy can affect the export and import of uh, this exosome? Um, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we, we published a paper a couple of years ago um, And I was going to touch on it today, but we didn't have time. So, you know, we found that LC3 um, was abundant in, in exosomes and that the autophagy machinery was helping to control the acidification of endosomes. And what, and there's been other papers that have come out since that have kind of reinforced that concept that LC3 is affecting the VATPAs, the complex that acidifies Um, endosomes and lysosomes. And what we think uh, is happening is that that's actually kind of a decision point in whether, uh, like a, a late endosome basically has a choice from what we understand of, it can degrade things, it can fuse with the lysosome and degrade its cargos, say like activated tyrosine kinase receptors, those usually the model is get degraded in the lysosome. Whereas they can also go back and fuse with the plasma membrane and release vesicles. And so we think, and, and our data from that paper shows that um, 
reversing the acidification of endosomes and lysosomes can basically cause those endosomes to change paths and go from you know, being degraded to being released as exosomes. Um, and, that, and that the autophagy machinery was helping to control that process. Um, so I think there's definitely things happening there. There's also evidence that autophagosomes can basically swallow up late endosomes and basically degrade the entire late endosome and that might have its effect. Um, but I think there's something maybe more complex happening there too because us and now others have shown that LC3 is really abundant in exosomes and controls packaging of some things into exosomes. And probably some of that machinery involved in autophagy like ATG5 and ATG16 are there as well. And so, you know, we really love the idea that it might be involved in the budding process to make the exosomes at the endosome, but we did a bunch of tests and that didn't seem to be the case at all. Um, but I think there's more to that story that is still waiting to be discovered. But anyway, I could probably go on more, but I think I'll stop there. It's very interesting uh, topics. Euh, si on n'a pas d'autres questions, je pense qu'on va s'arrêter là. Donc, ça conclut la présentation de Dr. Gibbings. Merci encore d'avoir participé à la conférence aujourd'hui. Bonne journée à tous.